Welcome everybody today to DAFA's eighth panel. Today's discussion is digital art as an investment. My name is James Quinn of Q9 Capital. I'll be your moderator today. And before we get started in this super interesting topic, I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists. I'm gonna start with the man on the screen. His name is Keith Grossman. He is joining us today from New York. It is 5 a.m. there, so we thank him in advance for joining us bright and early. We're looking forward to having him with us. Keith is the president of Time, where he oversees all business and technology. Uh, of responsibility for the brand. He served as Global Chief Revenue Officer for Bloomberg Media previously. He was also part of the core team to launch Quick Take at Bloomberg, and he was the Associate Publisher of Wired as well as Ars Technica. Directly to, to my left is Stacy Ho. Stacy is an author, blogger, and tech enthusiast, and she's working as an advisor at Move Network, a leading NFT aggregator. As an advisor, she supports blockchain and NFTs and has introduced NFT projects to collectors who've never purchased any crypto art before, which I think means a few of you in this room today <laughs> as well. Paul Howard here on the far left, my far left, is currently a director at BlockFi. He's a blockchain enthusiast since 2012. He has a background in computer science and spent over 15 years working at Goldman and Morgan Stanley in Hong Kong. He has a personal interest in art and investments and brings a technical appreciation of blockchain, a love of art and crypto to our panel. He's also been a headline speaker and specialized in all the different FIs we have in crypto, including DeFi, CFI, VC lending, and NFT. As I mentioned before, my name is James Quinn. I'm the managing partner of Q9. A Q9 we're a full service crypto investment platform. We combine products such as automated investment strategies and structured products to make crypto investing simple and safe. I am pretty excited to learn about NFTs today because investing in digital arts is something that I want to learn about myself. So I think to get us started, we have to ask the most simple elephant in the room question, which is, Paul, what is an NFT? An NFT in its simplest form is a non-fungible token. What does that mean? Well, let's take a dollar out of our pocket. One US dollar, one Hong Kong dollar is a dollar. It's the same as the other dollar in my pocket. Two dollars, same dollar. The same dollar can buy me the same thing. The same dollar can buy the same thing. These two are totally fungible. They're the same thing if in effect. What we have with non-fungible tokens is a unique dollar. Effectively, no other dollar will look like that other dollar. Now, we see this all around us. For example, I may have some money, a pile of cash in one hand, I may have a picture of the Mona Lisa in the other hand. The Mona Lisa represents something that is non-fungible. It isn't the same as the dollar. It is something unique that exists. And with digital currency and NFTs, what we're doing is really translating what has traditionally been a asset of one class, a unique asset, into a digital asset, but maintaining that uniqueness. And that has created this concept of digital scarcity and ownership. Nothing new, not a new concept, but just a new medium for us to be relaying the information to each other. Okay. So, okay, in practical I, terms. I, I'd so. like to add to that, actually. Yes. So, uh, thank you, everybody. Nice to see you and everyone on Zoom. Um, I've been kind of chewing on what's a really nice way to introduce people to NFT. And I've, I've kind of struggled a little bit to make it really accessible and digestible, a definition. And our group CEO of, of Move Network, Edwin, he told me, Stacey, it's okay. You know, the fact that NFT definition has a lot of discussion behind it is what makes it like attractive and how it's kind of NFT definition evolves. But I have like two kind of levels of to describe it to you guys. Okay. One is if you have a nephew who comes visit you, he's really excited to see you. Like this really close to Paul's example, but he opens your wallet, he takes out that $100 Hong Kong bill, he loves it, then he rips it, and then it's gone. You can go to the Hong Kong HSBC account, that ATM machine, take it out, it's replaceable, okay? Your same nephew, he goes to your wallet, has a photo of you that you took with your dad 35 years ago, and then it's got an autograph, it's something, a nice message from your dad, basically, and then he looks at it, and then he rips it. It's like, that's not replaceable. Right, so that's kind of the difference between that tangible. That photo is unique. Yeah, that photo is unique. And not only that, it's got that signature from your dad that he wrote 35 years ago. Right. Right, so that's not replaceable, 
right? And then, so that's one, one way of fungible, non-fungible. How about in the comic books? You know, comic books, they have like normal editions and then they have like first editions. So if you have a normal edition, Spider-Man comic, volume one or volume 22, something like that, you're reading, you're having your breakfast, you spill coffee on it. Uh, unfortunately, ugh, you can go to the comic book store, replace it. But if you had a Stan Lee, the type of comic book that it's in that plastic and he signed it and you accidentally lost it, it's very hard to replace that Stan Lee signature. And you actually, you couldn't, and that's non-fungible. And the signature, the Stan Lee signature, that is that kind of unique marker. And that's the difference of NFT. The T part is token and your digital asset is stored on the blockchain, which is the distributed ledger. That's my I, I think that's a great explanation. Yeah. May, may, I, may I give, um, I, I loved both of the definitions. And if I can, can I give just like further context for why people should care? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so, so, you know, like a lot of people keep coming to me and they're like, um, this is a bubble or this is crazy or what, what's going on. And the way that I explain it to a lot of people is very simple the behaviors of, of society and of individuals is just changing tremendously. And if you look back and you look at, let's say like 1993, right? Like everyone started to realize in 1993 that things can go online and be digitized. And so they're like, whoa, there's this internet thing and I'm gonna start to get information on it. And if you fast forward to 2007, um, you know, that's when social media really started to take off and people said, not only can I get things online, I could put my identity online, right? I, Keith Grossman, can be online. But the reality is, is that I'm online as a renter, right? And, and we all know what happens when you're a renter, right? You're giving up something in return. And what you're giving up is your data to, to, you know, Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or any of these social networks that are giving you in exchange the platform to, you know, present your identity. Um, 2010 comes around and we see a really important marker that hasn't really changed yet, which is, uh, which hasn't really evolved yet in, in a fast manner, but will, which is 3D printers hit a price point of about $2,500 or cheaper. And people started to realize, oh my God, everything that I've been putting online, everything that I've been taking from analog and making digital can all of a sudden go from digital back to analog at one point. So like now there's an exchange between these two worlds that's beginning to take shape. But then in about 2018, when NFTs came out, and really accelerated in 2020 when like we're all sort of at home, what you started to see was NFTs plus a blockchain uh, of any sort give people the opportunity to live online and have an ownership stake. And given that, like I would argue that none of us are offline individuals, right? Like I'm right now talking to you from New York City, right? Like nearly my entire life is online for the most part. Like, why would you want to be a renter when you can be an owner? And so I think for the first time, like one of the reasons why these NFTs are so important is not only because they're non-fungible, right? But because they allow people to live online and have an ownership stake. And so if you're going to spend a tremendous amount of time in, in this aspect of your life, right? Like when you have an ownership stake, what the NFT actually presents is a badge, Right. It either represents the same thing that, you know, owning a Gucci belt does or, you know, a, a piece of art in the real world does, or it represents your ability to enter into certain communities. Right. As oh, as a community yeah. member or it can actually act as a utility for so many other ways in which you can interact, whether that's medical records or or real estate deeds or concert tickets because you're able to all of a sudden track and see where a piece of ownership goes in the digital blockchain, in the digital environment now. And so, you know, off of the two previous definitions of what is an NFT and, and you know, like, how should you think about it? I think that the biggest thing that you should be thinking about is, is like, wow, I've been living, I spend a lot of my time online already. Do I want to be a renter, which is fine, or do I want to be an owner? 
which is even mm -hmm. more interesting. I like that because it basically means that the technology of NFTs combined with blockchain has bought has brought the uniqueness that we take for granted in the analog world to the digital world. And it didn't really exist before, right? It's each thing being unique in itself and essentially uncopyable if it's a unique item. But maybe we can get even a little bit more practical now in that sense, which is like, how, does, how do you buy an NFT? How do, you, how do you get an NFT? How do you get digital art represented yeah. by an NFT? Yeah, well, I, mean, a, I think that's a, what people want to know. A, a, yeah, a, a great question. And we're in the right environment to ask that as well, because right. here at Digital Art Fair, we are combining both the physical and the non-physical. So often you'll see a piece of art here for sale as a physical piece and also with the NFT. And the NFT is there to guarantee ownership in the digital realm. And so how would you go about purchasing something in the digital world like an NFT? Well, the easiest way is to take on a wallet. We can use a wallet, for example, it could be a MetaMask wallet. It could be any of these apps that you could download from the internet or download onto your phone that can be used to store that asset. Typically, they're transacted in Ethereum. So yeah. you're good to own a little bit of Ethereum as a cryptocurrency. You pop that in your wallet and you go onto a marketplace something such as OpenSea or um, Refinable, which is one of our partners here at the Art Fair. And on that website, you can browse the art, you can look at all the digital files and the movies and the NFTs. And with, with your wallet, you can connect, download and buy the art through the virtual world. And that ownership will then sit with you so that you can display your art either on your phone, in your gallery, in your collection, and advantages of that, of course, are that you don't have to invite everybody around your house to look at your art. You can show your art to a worldwide audience on mm -hmm. the internet without mm -hmm. anybody stepping foot in your house. Oh, does, does the NFT mean, does it say both that the, that piece of art is yours and that that is the original or unique copy of that art? Is that both, is both of those pieces of information within the NFT? So the NFT itself is effectively what we call a smart contract. Right. And in those smart contracts, we can embed information such as the original owner, mm -hmm. such as the current owner. Mm -hmm. We can embed information about the file or about the author or content of the file. And so the NFT and the smart contract can be coded to represent a number of different things, not just from JPEGs and pictures and paintings and um movies but it could also represent asset classes like for example real estate yeah. and uh, there's a hundred different uses for smart contracts that were really enabled by this new technology and by the nfts okay um anybody else want to talk about the practicalities as, as you've experienced them as relates to buying selling purchasing nft storing them security maybe oh sure <laughs> So when you have a, okay, for just very practical purposes, people ask like, is it risky? Is it mm. safe to purchase an NFT, right? The, the thing about um, safety is about when you have a wallet, it comes with something called a private key. And just visualize it's like a key to go into your door or it's your ATM pin code, right? So just like, do not give or keep that pin code pin very safely. Keep your private key safely. That is a very practical thing you have to do. Make sure because once someone has your private key, they have access to your digital assets. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Can you mention an idea. Ethereum as a protocol? Are there other protocols that are starting to be used more frequently? There, there, there are indeed. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Keith. Were you Keith, going yeah, to add something? Go. You have a better. This is a better, better topic. I like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there are, there, are, there are what we call different protocols and there mm -hmm. are different marketplaces as well. Mm -hmm. um, the two top protocols are really built on Ethereum at the moment mm -hmm. and um, the difference between them, one of them really is a, a, a simple token and the other protocol is a collection of tokens. So it will enable you to have collections of this single token. It's effectively like a kind of super uh, wrapper around the first protocol. Yeah. And then built on top of this are um, marketplaces, for example, Refinable or OpenSea mm. or SuperRare. And these marketplaces enable you like a stock exchange would to transact NFTs, to buy and sell those NFTs. Okay, okay. Um, I just want to add is yeah. I, I think that it's an invitation. Just go to OpenSea, 
the io is io or dot com at the io oh thank you the so, io but it, it's really cool because you'll just see all these like nice pictures and then you can click a picture and then when you click picture it's that digital art and they'll have you know their transaction history right they'll have all of those details and it's just this awesome invitation for us to explore that the nft has all of those informations built in the smart contract for people to know yeah yeah okay um decentralized exchanges or other methodologies of is that something worth talking about yeah i mean if you're interested you bring up the word decentralized exchanges i think we're all very used to having central exchanges whether it's hsbc or whatever bank we're using as a centralized entity one of the facets of blockchain technology is an enabling decentralization so you and i can do a transaction on the internet mm -hmm. i don't rely on a third party in between us and one of the concepts at the art fair here is that we can connect the artists directly with the buyers and to stacy's point about how we can look at that transaction history one of the things i find really interesting about nfts as an investment is that you can go back and track how that nft has been sold yes, online 100%. Mm -hmm. and if you try and look back to where it was originally minted and who's been buying it and who the collectors are and what else they collect is opening up a whole new ecosystem which didn't have or wasn't that accessible previously mm -hmm. right oh, i'd love I, to add i'd love to add to that keith keith go ahead and then we'll we'll get stacy here since yeah. you're trying to okay. jump in no i mean i i think that the transparency aspect is is an absolutely fascinating uh, part of the entire thing, right? So to be able to look at the provenance from mint all the way through ownership is is really um, is is an incredibly powerful aspect of it. I, I saw a question that was from an anonymous person in the audience of how do you convert, you know, a physical piece of art into an NFT? And like this, the provenance question actually answers that very well because if, for instance, somebody was to take a random piece of art that they owned and uh, but did not create and convert it into an NFT, it would not have the same value as if the artist itself themselves actually created that NFT with with, uh, uh, you know, the, its creation or if it came from a collection that was so well known and so famous uh from such a uh, uh from from uh, you know such esteem that that was the provenance of the creation of the piece of art but um like it, it's a really like i would say that um one of the most amazing aspects of this entire ecosystem is is one that it's transparent right yeah. two that it's decentralized and you know the decentralization aspect of it means that it's just as easy for um, me to make a purchase from a um, seller in Hong Kong as it is for a seller in Hong Kong to make a purchase from me in New York. And the the area that that you know we haven't even touched on, and and BlockFi can can probably talk about it even better is if you've ever made a purchase online. And this is the one area of the ecosystem that I think has to clean itself up a little bit, the digital wallets, getting people in, the onboarding, right? Like going from a fiat currency to, you know, let's say Ethereum to purchase. Um, and that will simplify itself over time. But if you've ever done it, uh, the costs are so nominal compared to traditional centralized manners that like you find that that it's it's one of the most magical experiences you've ever seen. And if you've ever struggled with, you know, um, uh, being rejected by a bank or something yes. of another, like I would say that the cryptocurrency environment, the crypto environment happens to be one of the most inclusive environments I've ever seen uh, uh, take place. And so sorry about that uh, on that front. I just um, I saw that one question and, you know, it's it, it wouldn't be as simple as I have this poster I want to um uh, uh, I want to put it, you know, uh, into an NFT, it, it won't make a difference in that, in that, in that manner, unless you have either the provenance that would support it or, um, uh, or you come from a collection that would support it. You did bring up a good point, which is actually just the fact that you can go direct digitally has dropped the cost for everybody to get involved in the space, right? Like, mm -hmm. 
it's transparent. You know what's happened in the past, mm. but you can go directly to somebody. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a middleman. Maybe these networks serve as a middle space, but that that is a lot larger scale an individual dealer. Yeah, it is, and I, and I think just to elaborate on Keith's point as well, uh, one of the things I found great about blockchain technology is that when I transfer money to somebody who may be on the other side of the world, let's say on a Friday night, the banks are closed. Mm -hmm. It's a U.S. holiday. I can't do NFX from my bank. I have to wait until Monday. I'm losing two days of interest because I can't get the money transferred. Who do I speak to? I call the hotline. I can't mm -hmm. even find where the money's gone. It disappeared on Friday when I transferred it out from my account. Joe Blow in the US doesn't have it yet. He's not going to get it till Monday or Tuesday. Yet on the blockchain, I can see that the transaction has left my wallet and is on its way to Joe directly. And where exactly it is in that stage? It's like tracking a FedEx parcel almost. Yes. And it gives folks, whether it's yourself or others in your organization, the ability to see that. And that uh, transparency that Keith was talking about, I think, is a real game changer for how we do transactions, not just in NFTs, but also in any financial service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A thousand percent. A thousand percent. I, I just want to add, add also, I was smiling because Candice is my friend in the audience and she spent like an hour and a half on the phone with me because she is from traditional art space. Sure. And she was sharing with me, she has over 20 years experience top, top museums, working with top museums. And she's like, Stacy, do you know what? There's so much asymmetric information out there in the traditional art space. 100%. The, the price, like exactly what, everything we're on the, like we're sharing the right stuff for you guys, like gold nuggets here is in the traditional art space. It's like, oh, how much did you buy it for? Oh, well, how much are you gonna pay it for? <laughs> it's like, it's not transparent. The, the whole beautiful thing about blockchain is the transparency and, you know, um, if, if I went to an art collector, I don't really know if I can trust that that's the price of the previous purchase unless I ask for the invoice, but the invoice can also be faked. So this is the, the gift of NFT as well. But can I add it's one thing really to that? Provenance, provenance, provenance. Yes, one thing to that because, because yeah. I think, Stacey, what you just said is so important. Yes. Um, and I think it's a really important aspect of what's happening in the art mm -hmm. world. Um, like a lot of people want to think that it's either or physical mm. or digital. And like, I think that what you're going to start to see over the years is a merging of living artists that do and, right? Yes. And I yes. can tell you that, you know, time, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a strategy of putting time into the crypto space or into NFTs, but we are really deep into this now. Okay. Um, but it came about because I'm just as hopefully you could see this dorky guy from New York City who grew up at Wired and went to Ars Technica, likes Bloomberg, loves art, and all of a sudden saw what the potential was to jump into this Web3 revolution uh, with, with NFTs with this brand. And when, when we did it the first time, you know, we initially started doing one of one NFTs, like really original pieces of our covers. And a lot of artists came to me, really famous artists, artists that sell their pieces for, you know, seven, eight figures at, you know, Sotheby's or Christie's. And they said to me, um, how do I get into this? Right. Like, what, how should I think about this? Um, I like I've never like my my audience doesn't care about NFTs. And so what I said to them was I said to them, well, this is how I would think about it. Um, and I asked one of them specifically, I said, what was the last piece? What was the last, what was the highest amount you sold your last piece for? And she said to me, $1.7 million. And I said to her, mm -hmm. how much does it upset you as an artist that in seven years or five years or whatever amount of time, the person who could outlay the $1.7 million is going to sell that exact piece for $10 million and you're going to make mm -hmm. nothing from it. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And she said, it drives me nuts all the time because I see this, right? Like the way that the economics for the artistic community has, has been set up to date has been that the artist only makes money off of the primary sale. With mm -hmm. smart contracts, you all of a sudden have the ability to set a royalty on the secondary sale. Yes. And so mm -hmm. my point to her was, um, if she created her physical work, but created an accompanied NFT of the physical work, and then sold it simply as the physical work 
with an accompanied NFT, then and put that in the provenance of her piece, then her piece actually becomes devalued over time if she broke that provenance and took away the NFT. But if she had to then ultimately sell the piece, if the person sold the piece in five years and they sold it with the NFT, if she put in in, in place, let's say a 5% or a 10% royalty, she all of a sudden could find herself making money on the secondary market. Yes. And one of the things that I find fascinating about this space is, is that it all of a sudden changes the economics for not just artists, but for anyone who enters into the NFT space to be able to make money on the primary and on the secondary. And I don't know if you saw, right, but like we did a cover of Time with Beeple back in, uh, you know, June of this year. And when I sold that cover, uh, uh, you know, I had an agreement with Beeple that uh, we would split the revenues of that sale 50-50 because we thought that, that was fair. It was just a handshake agreement. And that cover sold for $120,000, uh, sorry, for $320,000 uh, in June of, last, of, of this past year. And that night, five minutes later, I transferred $160,000 US dollars to, to Mike, to people uh, that evening. Oh. Um, oh. Yesterday or two days ago, that exact same piece was sold to Starry Night Capital for $2.4 million, okay? Amen. Five months later, four months later, I have no concept of time, even though I'm the president of time, I'm sorry. Right. And so, <laughs> uh, so uh, four months later, it sold for $2.4 million. Mike, mm -hmm. because he used the provenance of the piece and he's then sold it to me because it's the time piece. It was a time cover, right? If, if this is what it looked like. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you can see it. Right. Mike yep. got a transfer of 10%, right? So he got $240,000 yesterday because it was sold for, for uh, $2.4 million. And then he transferred back to me $120,000. And so everyone in this, in this chain won, if you think about it. You know, um, uh, we, we had a successful primary sale we don't resent the fact that there was amazing secondary sale. Mike was paid on the secondary sale. Time was paid on the secondary sale. And if it's sold again, it will continue in perpetuity. And so I think yes. that like when people start to see that, the artists start to realize that like, it doesn't make sense to ignore this ecosystem because all of a sudden this ecosystem is allowing them to actually make a better livable wage, whether they are, at the top end of the spectrum or if they're emerging. And then the final aspect I would simply say is the beauty of open sea to what you had said earlier or to any of these decentralized areas is that historically artists have been relegated to local economies. So yes, if you're a yeah. Hong Kong artist, like your best clients are most likely in region or in Hong Kong. And if you're a Mexican artist, your best clients are most likely in region, right, or in, in, in your city. Um, I, in my wallet, have art from all over the world, from artists that I never thought I would collect from, because all of a sudden, I have a marketplace that gives me exposure to so much different global perspectives. And I think that that's like the most beautiful aspect of this. And when you look at that, you start to realize, wow, not only do I get transparency, not only do I get ownership, not only do I get yes. speed, but like the everyone wins in this in this chain, the artist wins on the primary and the secondary. And, and I think that what you're going to start to see is not in either or. You're not going to see only NFT artists and you're not going to see only physical artists. You're going to start to see them merge together. And the best proof point I could point to that is, is Christie's when they did the Fewosh sale, the Fewosha sale, and it was a physical mm -hmm. pieces for the first time ever with 14 accompanied, you know, NFTs with it.
Now I'm done. I'm shutting up from New York. Sorry. Dude, I mean, explain. honestly, that was take it home. <laughs> that was a that was an amazing explanation, and I could not help but thinking about when you were talking that, like in the 1950s, musicians or writer music writers used to sell their sheet music for cents on the dollar, yes. and then it would go get produced, and they'd never see anything else. And I think it was maybe not the first group, but the first famous group was the Beatles, yeah. who actually took share of their royalties. Right. Yeah. And to me now, I was like, well, it's exactly the same thing. Yes. And then all of a sudden, now physical artists, digital artists, and as you mentioned, they're really just artists now. They're going to exist in both worlds, have a piece in that. These, all the different things that the technology is able to do, mm. all here in one panel. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so I think on that point, um, Keith, I mean, what, what do you think? And, and actually anybody in the panel, like what does the future look like from here? Maybe even farther down the road, like right now, I think it's about people discovering what's gonna happen, et cetera. I also like to think about a little bit how the NFTs themselves are really like this digital authentication piece and like carrying around that authentication piece and being able to pass that down and know where that's traded. And, you know, over time is gonna be really important. Does anybody wanna talk a little bit about the more long-term view of what the futures of NFTs or investments as relates to NFTs. What are the other maybe parts of the market that haven't been captured yet? I mean, you know, we are at the art fair, but we haven't discussed gaming. You mentioned real estate. How else, you know, how what, how else are we going to see this grow? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll take the the, the start of that. I think just uh, looking at how BlockFi's business has developed over the last four years. One of the things that I see in the next four years there will be the um, emergence of NFT as a collateralized asset class. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure, you know, you have your experience at Q9, this will be something that your clients are also keen to do, which is now I can prove I have ownership of this asset, whether yes. it is real estate or whether it's an NFT that represents a painting or a picture. I can now use that as collateral to get a loan, or I can use that as collateral to get borrow in USD or wherever it may be yes. um, to help me fund other things that I'm doing with my portfolio. So I really see NFTs as fitting into a portfolio of investments that people have and having that as a percentage or having a percentage of your wealth locked into an NFT is not just going to gain from the capital appreciation of the underlying asset, but also in the cryptocurrency that that's represented by. And I think further adoption in the sector from companies like BlockFi, like Q9, and being able to help people leverage those as viable assets is the way that we emerge in the next five years. And to a point made earlier, I think, was really on the uh, bridge that Digital Art Fair is creating with the uh, physical and the non-physical by connecting artists and people directly is going to see NFT itself really just be a reflection of digital art. People will walk around an art fair like this today and think, hang on, I don't just wanna buy the physical anymore. I want the NFT as well. Oh. And I think that's something that we'll see over the next five years gain increasing popularity. Yeah, that's massive. Completely changes the liquidity profile of art and anything that can be associated with an NFT because it's not a missed opportunity, even if it's an interesting investment for you to do other things with your capital. I, really I'm, good point. I'm really excited about art and the growth of art in the future. I don't know if you have friends or yourself or your family, like you've heard people say, I like art, but you know, there's no money in art. You can't, you can't like bring home the, the bacon with art. You know, I can't feed my rice with the art. Like how do I make money with art? But imagine everything that Keith said, right? You can have an NFT, a digital art that you could have perpetual royalty from. So there's going to be more economic incentive for artists to know more and to learn more to get and create digital art. And that's something that Move Network's really passionate about. For example, downstairs in our, in, well, if you happen to be here in Digital Art Fair, we're at the Pioneer Zone. And we've had, we talked to local artists in Hong Kong who didn't have their art on the open sea. And we talked to them, we walked them through how to get their art, how to make a smart contract and educating. We're having workshops because we just feel that, um, you know, even me when I was kind of new to NFTs, it's kind of daunting. It feels, feels so complicated. People are like talking Spanish to me or, or like different language to me. What, what's going on? But it, it's like, it, it's worth it. It's really worth it to take that time to digest and to get involved because mm. the wave it's moving it's happening mm. and this it's kind of an evil word but it's a really big word 
to know is asymmetric information. People make abnormal profits in asymmetric information. And it's time that NFTs help to bring back the power to the people, right? Like if you like this artwork, you can actually just message or somehow the the on the OpenSea platform or all these different platforms, you can contact and you can purchase directly. That's the beauty of decentralized exchange. And then I, if you want to go to an art gallery, yeah, 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 sorry, Keith. Uh, no, 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 like, but like, you know, if Please. you, rock, paper, scissors. Uh, so, but you know, <laughs> it's kind of like, it's, it's like how the, the beauty of NFTs or the beauty of this whole crypto, this blockchain revolution is that we get to involve and it's very inclusive and accessible to everyone. Yes, this is the future. Yeah, Keith? I, no, so, so first off, sorry, it's very funny. I'm watching myself and I know what I'm doing in my, in my hand gestures and I'm seeing myself on a slight delay. So I got to get to see my rock, paper, scissors to you. So I apologize on that one. <laughs> what did you put? What did you put? Who won? Who won? Who won? Who won? Who won? Who won? Um, so, so um, a, a few things that that I just I saw in in um, uh, the comments that I just want to quickly jump at, which is um, we're still in very early phase of this. Okay, so like I mean, when I say very early phase, OpenSea is the largest exchange, and they have only about four hundred ninety thousand active wallets. And when you look at that. You know, back in March of this year, uh, like they had about 60,000 active wallets, right? But the wallets don't mean active people. They just mean that it's different wallets connected to the site and in one individual could have multiple wallets. So you have to assume that we're talking about an entire ecosystem that is, is probably closer to 200,000 people, right? That is really you know, um, driving a, a movement forward. And I think that, that that just gives you sort of some size and some scale of like, of where we are today. Um, OpenSea is, is the largest, it's essentially, you know, it, it's in the US, I would say it would be the Amazon of, of the NFT marketplace. You can see anything there, right? High quality, low quality, all different types of art in there. Um, uh, you know, I, for time have played on two specific exchanges. Um, OpenSea for the timepieces launch that we did, because I want it to be a much larger collection. And then on Super Rare, but Super Rare is very specific because Super Rare's audience is one of ones, right? Very high end art in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, the question somebody asked, I think it was William Lee, that I thought was a great question. Why didn't I automate sort of payments or royalties in the smart contract is um, we're still in a very early stage of of how smart contracts are being developed and stuff that like you couldn't do in March, you can do today. And, you know, um, right now, uh, you know, with timepieces, for instance, and I haven't really publicized this, but like, I think it's an important thing. Um, every artist that participated in timepieces when we launched this, um, uh, the first 1% of the primary sale and on the secondary sale goes to charity. Um, then the remaining 99% is split evenly with the artists. Right. And in our turn in perpetuity on primary and in secondary sales. So think about how different of an arrangement that is with the artistic community, with a brand. Right. And what was really interesting was, um, you know, because it's not automated today and OpenSea has told us that they'll have automated royalties in real time paid out um, uh, within the next six months. Right. It's a complex mm -hmm. thing to be able to do on on the Ethereum um a blockchain it's easier to do on other blockchains but the reality is is most of the art is really on the ethereum blockchain today um I, that once they have that then yeah every smart contract will be automated until then what we have to deal with is uh we have to deal with going through essentially the world's largest csv file to make sure that all of the <laughs> artists are are sort of paid what they're properly oh. due on the secondary sales. And so the agreement that I had with the artist was that we would pay them within 30 days on the primary sale. And then not with every quarter, they would get a transfer from us in ETH um, on the secondary. Now, what was even more interesting though, and this goes back to like what I love about sort of the um, immediacy of how this transforms business is um, with NFTs, there's zero float. So when we did our minting, uh, you know, like we got paid that day literally instantaneously 
And so I woke up that morning, the next morning, it was a Thursday that we did our minting. And I woke up the next morning and I had all of this uh, ether in my, in my wallet, in the time wallet. And what I did was it was a Friday and it didn't make a difference where in the world the artist was. I transferred every artist, you know, what was the equivalent of a significant amount of ether on the primary sale. Um, from the time wallet to their wallet with a thank you and with a little note saying like, I just wanted to get the world record in for fastest vendor artist payment in the history of time. Right. And like, right. that's something that you can't do, you know, in, in a traditional business sense. Um, and so like, I just, I bring that up because the question of like, I can't wait until the technology advances to the point of, of um, automatic splits where I don't even have to think about this, that the artist yes. just gets paid on the second uh, that the sale takes place with no delay and that, that it gets divided automatically. Um, uh, the second thing I would just say, and, and again, apologies, like you got me early in the morning, so I'm a little long-winded, right, on this, but um, uh, we are at the earliest point of this, right? And in any oh. sort of evolution, you're going to have moments where there's mania and you're going to have moments where that there's sort of um uh, uh despair and you know in march of this year everyone was going oh my god oh my god oh my god nfts 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 and then between mm -hmm. i would say may and july of this year everyone was like oh that craze was done and then all of a sudden you start to see everyone who bought really incredible things during that time start to see record returns uh again and uh, my advice would be um, the same thing as with physical art. You know, I wouldn't, if you're gonna buy a piece of NFT art, um, uh, buy it with the expectation that you love it and that it means something mm -hmm. to you and it connects with you emotionally. Don't buy it as an investment today, right? Buy it because you love it. Now there's a shot that it could be a great investment Right. I've made some great investments personally in it. And and it's and 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 I've bought pieces that I've loved. Um, uh, but I've also bought pieces that, you know, like are probably going to go down to zero. The reality in the physical art world, though, too, is, is that 99 percent of the pieces do go down to zero. OK. And like people mm. have to recognize that. And it's really just a one percent of the physical artists that you start to see tremendous profits on. And so if you look at this in the digital art space as a get rich quick scheme, like it's actually the single worst way or lens to, to look at what is actually taking place. But if you look at it through the lens of everything that has been discussed previously, you start to see that this is a, a societal humanity, global trend that's taking place and and ultimately over time, you have to ask yourself, is the world gonna be more digital in five years than it is today? Am I going to be online more in five years than I am today? Am I gonna want an ownership stake in what I do online five years from today more than I am today? And do I, like, if the answers to those three questions are yes, then that's what the NFT technology provides you. Keith, I think that's a great place to move into Q and A because we actually have a packed house and a mm. bunch of questions online. But just to wrap up, what I think one of the big takeaways here, which is really interesting to think about, is that ultimately, in broad strokes, NFTs mean more value accruing to artists and better deals accruing to consumers. Mm -hmm. And if more value is accruing to artists, that means probably more art. And I like the way yes. that looks for our future here. Yes, yes. But I have to start off with the, you know, the question I think everybody's been asked who's in the NFT space, which we just have to ask here. Mm -hmm. um, any of you should jump in to answer this, but here's the question. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the netizens who say, you're crazy to pay 10,000 bucks for an NFT when you can simply take a screenshot and have that JPEG for free? Why get the NFT? I think we all know the answer to that question, but it's an important one to say. Anyone? Go. I mean, yeah. I, 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 okay. No, you no, no. I, I'll say Paul. Paul, oh, Paul, Paul. Ladies first. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, 
it's a really good point, right? It's a such super good question. The whole idea is something we all been saying, Paul said it earlier, it's about ownership. So yeah, for sure, go ahead and screenshot like that, but you don't own it, right? You don't own the rights to it. You can't produce products and receive like money from it. You don't have the IP to it, but when you buy the NFT, so if I, if I buy an NFT, I own it. I can make like school bags <laughs> like with the pictures of it. I can make t-shirts. I can anything I, oh, and you know what people are doing now? They're using it as their avatar, like crypto punks. And it's a way to show your social status. Yeah, you can kind of screenshot someone's crypto punk. And so you can look like you own it, but that's not really cool. You know, so there's that whole part of ownership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you could do the same with a Rolex. You could go into Moncock Market down yeah. the road from here, right? And <laughs> yeah. and and buy a, a 50 US dollar Rolex, or mm -hmm. you can go and buy a $50,000 one from the shop. But, um, you know, that's the it's that's really the difference true. between what you're doing. It's, it's the same thing in, mm -hmm. in the art world, right? Mm -hmm. You could take a screenshot or you could own the actual asset. And I think Keith may want to add something on that as well. Oh, I think you said it exactly the same thing, right? I mean, like, look, the Mona Lisa exists in one place, but there's infinite copies of the Mona Lisa online, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, the the there are few there are few arguments that uh, are are what I would say are fair, logical arguments, but at the same time, uh, you know, you know, are missing the bigger point or the bigger picture, right? Like people who still conflate the use of crypto with criminal activity, people who still conflate the, you know, ownership of NFTs with just them simply being JPEGs. They're not simply JPEGs. That's what, that's the point that like I have to, to hit home, like in bringing up crypto punks, right? Which, you know, is in a, in a sense, a form of art, but also in a bigger sense, a form of community and belonging. Correct. Look at the world we live in today right? Like I can't even get over to the digital art fair because I sit in New York and like there's the, like we are trapped in our sort of little bubbles. And yet at the same time, I'm willing to bet that if I was sitting on stage with, with everyone, like we would be having coffee afterwards, sort of talking and forming an incredible friendship. Mm -hmm. um, the, what people don't realize is there's an element of the NFT art market that's fine art, right? That's the stuff that you see that, that is the equivalent of the Mona Lisa's. What, uh, what other people don't realize is, is that when you look at things and you think, what are the board ape yachts? What are the crypto punks? What are the cool cats? What are all of these things that are emerging? Yes, they're pieces of art in a sense, but they're also a larger community that's evolving underneath them. And if you mm -hmm. go in and you start to see what those communities are allowing is, is for people to reset a sense of belonging in a world where people are de-aggregated and like people are able to find commonalities. And I think that I know this wasn't a, a, a panel on, on NFTs as a reset of social sort of societal uh, experiments, but I, but I do think that what you're finding in some instances is that um, uh, there are, there are areas of the NFT marketplace, such as the crypto punks that owning a crypto punk is not just owning an asset. It's being part of a community and that community is adding just as much value to that asset as the asset is itself. Um, yes. and so, you know, like, I, like, I, like there's I, like, I don't necessarily like to argue with the JPEG, uh, debate. I don't like to argue with, you know, certain debates in this because, Ultimately, we're at such an early moment of, of, of this, this, I would say, evolution slash revolution into Web3, which is the notion that the community ultimately, uh, you know, dictates the creative or the creator, which is then sort of represented by a platform as opposed to Web2, which is a platform ultimately decides who the creators are and then presents that to the community. Um, I think we're in such an early stage of this that... Um, people will start to understand it at their own comfort level. And like, what I don't want to do is, is I never want to force feed down. Well, if you don't understand that it's a JPEG today um, argument, what I'd rather just simply say is, is come in it at your comfort level. We're still really early, right? But like, what I'm saying is, is from my perspective and my vantage point, this is a trend. This is not a fad. Yes. I mean, mm. the copies in the originals are not anathema to each other like you brought up the Mona Lisa example. There's copies of the Mona Lisa 
there's the original they both serve their purpose which one do you want in your house and for every artist there's going to be that opportunity i think right mm -hmm. um for the studio audience you please answer you know ask questions as well we're gonna yes go ahead hello um thank you to the whole panel um uh, i have two questions uh, just oh, to sorry, give a little bit. oh thank you to the panel uh just to give a little bit of background of myself mm -hmm. so uh i had a firm called cybertecture mm -hmm. and uh, we are developing a number of crypto uh real estate projects mm -hmm. around the world mm -hmm. um but um i like to ask the panel two things um first of all uh, the fluctuations and the uh, kind of uncertainties in terms of the governance of cryptocurrencies around the world adds to a lot of risks to these investments and these projects. You know, people think they work, but then they're worried about how the currencies will be very, very unstable. So I'd like to hear um, that's the first question is you know, from the panel, how you see that will resolve itself in the medium and the long term. And then the second question is, in terms of the NFTs themselves, they've started to become much more well known for artwork, right? Because art is easier to define for an NFT. What other categories are in the marketplace do you think the NFT will reach to next uh, in terms of reaching a critical mass of recognition, investment, and being part of the economy? So those are my two questions. Thank you. Maybe I'll start with the broad cryptocurrency yes. question i'll take the second one which is basically you know the volatility in itself may scare people off but you have to remember that part of the volatility component is the potential gigantic upside for any of the given cryptocurrencies and i'll start with the most simple and well-known example which would be bitcoin if the narrative of bitcoin is that it is the new digital gold or it's a new form of money when it was first getting started and it was had a very cheap price at any thought any speculation in the market or change of law that might make that even 1% more likely to be true, that would cause massive volatility to the upside. And then when it starts to be the case that, oh, maybe that's not true, that's causing the downside to happen. But it's hard to believe when you look at something and it being so much more volatile than you say, you know, equity or a market that's much more mature, it actually has become less volatile over time. Uh -huh. And most of the major cryptocurrencies that have survived have done so. So I think you have to ask yourself as an investor, at which point do you want to be involved in the market? Do you want to be involved much later when it's much safer? And I think there's perfectly good reasons to do that. Or do you want to be involved much earlier when you have to take that risk, but the opportunity for upside is much greater? And today you'll have a, a massive uh, ecosystem of coins to choose from all along that volatility spectrum for you to do so. So I think you can broadly go and go, oh, it's too volatile. I mean, there's all kinds of ways from a risk management perspective in terms of sizing and management where you can adjust for that and part of your investment portfolio. But people have to remember that one of the reasons for the volatility isn't simply the downside, it is the exponential upside opportunity of the cryptocurrency ecosystem in general and each of the individual coins as they might deliver value. Now, maybe the NFT question. Oh, yes, yes, Actually, I'd like to add on to the first question, too. So we have a, a friend who in Netherlands has a crypto property project. And what he did is that he set up a, com set up a company, uh, register in Netherlands, and he purchased two apartments, group purchase, group buy from his friends. And then he created his own token and um, that represents everyone's individual <clears throat> investment. And then those properties will be rented out. So if you had a million of his um, token, million of his tokens, you'd receive $100 in USDT a month, 100 USDT a month. So there are ways that you could incorporate um, NFTs and um, creating your own crypto token for your own individual company that doesn't necessarily have to have that market volatility mm -hmm. because it's determined by your demand and supply of your own company's personal token. It's not like you're linked to Bitcoin. It, it, and then it's just really like demand and supply of your to like your token basically that you create for your company. Um, that's one of the things that uh, Move Network we do. We, we do um, NFT like advising how to help like traditional analog companies move to having awesome solutions like this in the digital space. Mm -hmm. um, to your second question, and I really was, I'm so happy you asked because I was really praying because I really wanted to talk about GameFi. I don't know if you guys have heard about GameFi. 
it's um, called Gain Finance, something like that. But it's really changing people's lives in countries like Philippines and Venezuela. And I actually last night bought a team from Axie Infinity. I'm so excited. Um, but they have this thing where you can play a game on your phone. Okay. It costs around um, each Axie, each Axie that you, you purchase, you buy a team and you play. As you play and you earn points, those points are um, tokens that are on, available on Binance that you can use as cash to cash out. And that's called Smooth Love Potion. So, so this, this application is there are people because of COVID, they can't get jobs, but they have a phone. They can play for two hours at home and they can earn income from it. And in Philippines, people are putting down payment for their house using SLP. And not only that, it's like, uh, you know, the value of S SLP used to be 41, was 41 cents at the all time high, and now it's six cents. So um, people can earn around like um, 300 or 390 US dollars. It's not a lot in Hong Kong, but in developing countries, it's huge. In Venezuela, it's huge. It's replacing people's, you know, full-time job in Venezuela can give maybe like 50 US dollars working nine to five, but you could play on your phone for a game that has strategy tactics and earn a living. It, I think this is a really exciting aspect of NFTs that you're gonna be growing, um, that I'm really excited about. It's about how we can help people get out of poverty, help increase different avenues for people to have income. So I really um, excited, and that's an invitation for you guys to check that space out. One more example of how NFTs and crypto are democratizing yes. economic opportunity. Mm. To mm. kind of put Absolutely. It in more Broadway. Yes. Well, maybe since we only have about three minutes left, I will bring it back to a last question on art. Mm. And the actual question is, um, what is the reason that NFTs have struggled to go mainstream? Is it because there's some underlying information that is not explained clearly, but I'd like to flip that on its head a little bit. They're pretty new. It's pretty new to be saying like they're struggling to go mainstream. <laughs> if you ask me, I think they're, they're having quite a good start. I'll just leave my two cents in at the end here, and then I'll let each of you kind of finish with your final thoughts before we wrap up, which would be one of the things that occurred to me that was really interesting about NFTs as they started to be applied specifically actually to art was people love that there was a physical element to it. Mm -hmm. Even when people are getting into crypto, a lot of people cannot get their hand around the fact that they can't touch a Bitcoin. Mm. That just, that a lot of people it just takes them a long time to like, wait, where is it? Can I touch it? Where, you know? And I think actually art has a little bit of an advantage and NFTs on art have a little bit of an advantage of getting into people's hearts and minds and the fact that you can take it home. You can display it somewhere, it's physically yours, it looks like something and the fact that it's unique. So that, that would be my kind of final thought on art and value and going mainstream. But he's talked about, why don't we, we start off with you before we get kind of our two uh, in-house opinions. Keith, uh, you've talked a little bit about how it's just the beginning, but maybe some of your final thoughts on what mainstream means for NFTs. Sure. So um, I, I take it very seriously that, you know, as the president of time, uh, you know, like we have a brand that is globally recognized, right? And uh, there are certain things that when we do, you know, it begins to signal mainstream, right? Adoption. And, um, you know, like this is a brand that's been around for 98 years. It's a brand that has gone through um, many trends and cycles and, and whatnot. And, you know, I was brought in to make sure that it can you know, be around for another 98 years, right? And as, as I would say. And, um, you know, what's really interesting is uh, we, we initially entered into the marketplace with these one of one NFTs and we treated mm -hmm. that as fine art. But then the second thing we did, and this is really important, is we started to accept cryptocurrencies for digital subscriptions, right? And we accepted 32 different cryptocurrencies for digital subscriptions. And we did that because we wanted to make sure that we signaled to a new generation, right? That we're inclusive. And if you think about how a media company or a brand has historically been able to capture revenue, right? Like it's been a funnel that's about this size, right? Which is essentially 
fiat currency, right? I would say cash in the United States, but fiat currency, right? A check or a credit card. With 32 different cryptocurrencies, I'm able to all of a sudden expand the funnel to be more inclusive for anyone who wants to enter into the sort of ecosystem. The third is, is we started to do deals with partners. And the deals that we did with partners, we allowed them to pay us in cryptocurrency. And we were very, very, very um, uh, vocal about this. Um, we accepted a deal with Grayscale, uh, one of the largest mm -hmm. asset managers in the crypto space where they paid us in Bitcoin. And we're about mm -hmm. to announce a deal where somebody will pay us in Ethereum, right? Mm -hmm. And we hold Bitcoin and Ethereum on our books, but we don't, mm -hmm. we don't hold other cryptocurrencies on our books. Like those are the two biggest ones that, that we feel are, are stable enough from a, a, an organizational standpoint to be able to manage against our existing business. Um, the fourth is, is looking at Steve, where utility. We're running Sorry. out of time here. Oh. So uh, maybe we'll leave it there with your third point because uh, okay. you kind of left with the top two cryptocurrencies, but thank you everybody for coming today um, for our panel, both in person and online. If you haven't had a chance to make it to the Digital Art Fair, I can tell you it is truly amazing. Please stop by and thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'm sorry thank for being you. so long. Thank you. Thank you.